And this is Michelle over here. And Michelle is from a rescue, which I'll tell you about later on after the show, if you're interested. Uh, what we have today are a wide variety of different pets. And we're going to share with you some information about all these pets. And then after the show, we'll get to the best part for you guys who like to touch, like to ask questions. We will invite you to come up. We'll have some of the animals out that you can touch, and you can ask us any questions that you might have, and we'll do that after the show. So during the show, we just try and show you as many as we possibly can, and then afterwards, we take your questions and help you to uh, interact a little bit more with them. So our first animal that we're going to take a look at is Basil, and Basil is one of our store pets. This simply means that she lives here at the store. She's not for sale. She was brought in by a customer who can no longer take care of her. And Basil is in her late 20s. That's our best guesstimate. There are some ball pythons known to live up to 40 years old, but basically Basil is a senior citizen. She's a very old ball python. When she came to us, she had some issues with her eyes, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So she continues, even though we've had her for years, she continues to have some issues with her eyes. Uh, so you might look at her eyes and see that they look like they're bulging a little bit. Uh, we're gonna talk about how that happened with her. So this is what we call ball python. They get the name ball python because out in the wild, if they were scared, they would actually roll up into a tight little ball and tuck their head in between the folds of their body to protect their head, because of course the head is a very sensitive part. You'll notice that Basil is not rolling up into a ball. Once the ball pythons get used to being handled, they're very unlikely to roll up into a ball anymore because they're not afraid of you touching them. But if you went out in the Africa, you saw a wild ball python, you tried to touch it, which would never be a good idea, it would probably roll up into a tight little ball to protect itself because it doesn't know if you're gonna hurt it or not. Now, all of our snakes are covered with a special kind of skin. Each one of these is called a little scale. The scales protect the snake when they're crawling around out there. They're not getting hurt. Think of it as like your fingernail protecting the soft, sensitive part of your finger. You ever cut that fingernail back a little bit too far and it's sort of ouchy? The scales are protecting the snakes when they're crawling around. So they're sort of like a fingernail. Think of it as a fingernail. Now, this over top of their eyes, we talked about Basil's eyes. Over top of their eyes, they don't have an eyelid. So snakes can never close their eyes like we do. Instead, they have a very special scale called a spectacle scale. It is a clear see-through scale. It sits right over top of their eyes. The only time the spectacle scale is not see-through is when a snake gets ready to do this. What do we call this when a snake does this? Well, they leave this behind. Oh. Yes. They shed their skin. And for a couple reasons. Oh, no. One is they're growing, especially if you have a little hatchling snake. It's growing, getting bigger. They're going to shed more often because this outer skin gets too tight. Second reason is they're crawling around on their belly. They're wearing out the skin that's underneath their belly. They need to replace that because it gets worn out. And there's a third really important reason that reptiles shed their skin. It's a way to heal themselves. Just suppose Basil were to get down on the ground and she got against something like a sharp rock or a piece of glass or metal and she cut herself. Even though it wouldn't normally be time for her to shed her skin, she'd get ready to shed because of that cut. And the next time she did her shedding, that cut would start to heal. So reptiles will shed their skin as a way of healing themselves. Also, if they're out in the wild, they might get... Um, Bugs, like dogs and cats can get fleas and ticks, while reptiles like snakes can get mites. And if they're out in the wild and they have mites, they might tend to shed their skin. The mites come off with the shedding, the snake crawls to a new area. So it's a way to get rid of external parasites, external little bugs. Now, right before a snake gets ready to shed, that special spectacle scale that sits over top of their eyes is not clear anymore. And that is because in between the old skin that's ready to come off and the new skin that's underneath, there's a fluid called molting fluid. It sort of makes it slippery and easier for the snake to get their shedding off. Well, that causes the spectacle scale to look all blue or gray color because of that molting fluid. So right before a snake is getting ready to shed, they can't see very well. Their eyes are all blue or gray in color. What other sense do they use, though, to tell what's around them? What do they use? What do snakes usually do? What do you see them doing? Yes. You know? 
take a guess. They stick out their tongue. So every time their tongue comes out, they pick up dust from the air, carry it back to something called a Jacobson's organ. It's like a smell and a taste mixed together, and it lets the snake know what's around him. So even though there might be times he can't see very well, his Jacobson's organ lets him know what's there. These are the spectacle scales. If you look at this shedding, can you guys see the clear scales there? So when your snake sheds its skin, you want to make sure that you're looking for the spectacle scales. Make sure that they came off with that shedding. Because what happened with Basil in her previous home is she had layers and layers and layers of spectacle scales. So she was shedding and shedding, but the spectacle scales were stuck on her eyes and they built up and they caused her to get an infection in her eyes. So we had her to one of our vets and uh, she had some cream and a shot of antibiotics because it was a full-blown infection. And she got over that, but she does tend to have fluid build up in her eyes. Every once in a while, we take her to one of our vets and they'll drain her eyes. And, and sometimes when you look at her, it'll look like, oh, they still look a little cloudy or they look a little bulging. That's where that comes from. Now this is a ball python that would be the normal, what we call normal phase. If you went out into Africa, this is most likely the ball python that you would see. It would look just like this, this these colors and the patterns. And Casey, do you have a ball python that is a morph? Okay, okay, so we're gonna take a look at that guy next to show you what a morph looks like. So this is still a ball python, but it's just a different color, different pattern. And these animals are most likely captive born. That means they were born in somebody's home. They weren't taken from the wild um, years ago. There was more wild caught than we have now. So we have a lot of local breeders um, that we try and purchase from, including Crazy Frog Lady here. And uh, that's always healthier because you want to take a captive born animal as opposed to try and take something from the wild. So when a ball python breeder will breed ball pythons, although they might take some that are the normal color, they're more likely to take one that gets a little different because the ones that are different colors and patterns, people tend to you know like those a little more, you know, a little fancier, so of course you pay more money for them. So this is a, a hatchling, it's probably a few months old, but when they come out, they come out of an egg, and the egg is about the size of a chicken egg. That's about the best way to describe it. Now, when they're inside of an egg, they have an egg tooth on the tip of their nose. They use an egg tooth to cut a slit in the egg, and then they crawl out of the egg. A few days later, the egg tooth falls off. The snake no longer needs it. Now, that snake right there can actually eat full-size mice. That's what he eats. Um, it's baby snakes, hatchling snakes, they can eat twice a week depending on how you want to feed them. They could also go once a week or once every other week, but when they're babies, you want to feed them more often because they're growing faster, right? When they get to be adults, they can go a lot longer. Snakes and other reptiles generally use 90% of the food that they put in their body, so very little comes out in waste. So they don't waste much of it. So they, they don't tend to need to eat every day like we do or like your dog or your cat does, okay? All right, what do you have next, Casey? Yeah, do you have more snakes? <laughs> I always want more snakes. Do you have more snakes? Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, always more snakes. <laughs> you are crazy frog lady. You're going to have to say crazy frog and snake lady, I guess, and lizard and uh, bug lady. She's a bug lady, too. You guys ever hear of isopods? Some people use them as clean-up crews in their tanks. Some people use them as feeders, and other people have isopods as pets and they collect different varieties. Okay, so what does Marie have there? Corn snake? Milk snake, I'm sorry. I should have known, from here, the color looked like corn snake, but I should have known from the attitude that it was a milk snake. Milk snakes, um, when they're, especially when they're hatchlings like this, they don't really like to be handled, as you can see. They get a little wild. They're often used in movies to imitate venomous coral snakes. There's a little rhyme that can help you to remember in most cases. Red touching yellow kills a fellow. So if you see a snake brightly colored, red is touching yellow, it's a venomous snake. Red to black, friend of Jack. 
But in a movie, if you're sitting around watching a movie, you see a brightly colored snake, you're not going to go, red to yellow kill, unless you're one of us. And then you're going to say, that's not a coral snake. But that's what they use oftentimes. Now, milk snakes were, you know, they got the name because they hung out a lot in dairy bars, and people thought they actually ate or drank milk. They do not drink milk. They happen to like to eat the rodents that are in the barns that are eating the feed that the cows drop on the ground. Believe me when I tell you that snakes are very important for us to have out in the wild. If you are a barn owner of any sort, you need to have snakes around. Otherwise, you end up with dead, drowned mice and rats in your water buckets. I can tell you, um, I first moved one of my horses to my uncle's barn and hated snakes. Hated them. But he had lots of snakes. We used to clean out the uh, stalls and find black rat snake eggs in the stall because of course that dwarf from the decaying manure in there is a good place to incubate the eggs but he didn't like snakes and he got rid of them and i used to find dead rats in bill's water bucket all the time finally we convinced him that these snakes are good and eventually he left them hang out they actually went up in his wife's um planter hanging planter basket uh, you know it, it was a a little bit of a challenge, a little bit of an education, but eventually we didn't have dead rats and mice in our water buckets anymore. Plus, you know that rats and mice can carry a lot of diseases that can be dangerous for humans and animals, so you want to have a few snakes around. They're very important whether you like them or not, okay? <laughs> yes, and they musk, and they get real wiry. Sometimes they'll bite you, but honestly, their teeth cannot pierce your skin at that size. And if they do, it's like a little pimp. Okay, Casey, do you have any more snakes or should we move on to Michelle? We will move on to Michelle. Michelle, if you can tell us about your snakes, that would be great. I'm going to put Basil back. Thank you. 
Okay. Yes, go ahead. Because okay. lizards are next. Okay. <laughs> so we'll you, you go ahead. Buddy, it's okay. So dandelions are one of their favorite foods. Um, 
the, for this guy anyway, of course you wouldn't want to go out where you don't know if it's been treated with pesticides. Marie knows where these come from next to her home. She knows there's no pesticides, no fertilizer on it, so she's safe with these. And, well, come on, buddy. Yeah, come on. <laughs> I think he has stage fright. Just a little bit of stage fright. Yeah. And bearded dragons have the nice snails, which allow them to climb. But they're not going to be up in the top of the tree like the iguana. But they do like to climb a little bit. Oh, okay. We can try a super worm. All right. We'll try a super worm, too. Bearded dragons can make good pets. If you take a look underneath his uh, chin, that's where they can inflate it to make themselves look bigger. A lot of animals, their protection is making themselves look bigger. So he would inflate that flap of skin underneath there and look like he had a beard, look bigger, and hopefully scare whatever's scaring him away. How about this buddy? He's like, no, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm speechless, folks. I'm eatless. <laughs> All right, well, while we're looking for him to eat, why don't we go ahead and take a look at the, uh, oh, well, we have him out. We'll do the him first. Okay, so this is, this is one of our savannas, Savannah Monitor, and these guys normally get, you know what, I'll let you handle it. He's stuck on you, I don't want to pull him off. These guys normally get what they call dog tame. Now, of course, we know that any animal has a mouth, they can and will bite if they feel threatened, but in most cases, you're, are you going to eat it? It went under you. Your Savannah Monitor ends up being a very friendly lizard. Uh, on average, they can grow about three feet long. The savannas, anywhere. There are those monitor lizards that grow much larger. Um, they are meat eaters. So, oh, super worms, right, buddy? Does he like canned snails? We'll eat anything. Do you have food for it? <laughs> I, I, I will eat anything. We thaw out meat. Now, what kind of meat does he like to eat, Casey? Okay, fish. Chicken. Now, he, it requires a, a very large enclosure. A lot of these animals, you want their enclosure to be bigger than you'd ever think they'd need um, because they want to have room and they also want to be able to, what we call thermoregulate, go between the heated side and the cooler side of their enclosure, okay? That's very important for reptiles. If you don't give them a large enough enclosure, they can't really thermoregulate, so they're staying under the heated side too long or they're in the cooler side and they shouldn't be. What do you think? Well, he's stage fright. I'm telling you, these kids have stage fright. All right, he's like, oh, who's that up there? And you can see Casey has him on a leash. I've seen him outside on his leash. Of course, you want to be very careful when he's on, there we go, when he's on his leash. Uh, because they can get off the leash if they get scared, they'll get very, windy and do like a death roll like oh he says i don't need those tongs i'm going to eat this myself okay there we go <laughs> so he's a meat eater insects of all kind turkey chicken those are the things you would thaw out for him fish as casey said and um <laughs> what does he eat anything else they might not oh yes hornworms aren't they lovely they're so cool. These are hornworms. He loves hornworms too. A lot of animals like hornworms. So that's our savannah monitor. And we do have a uh, tiny, tiny, they come out about this big when they're hatchling. So did they say how old this one was? No, they didn't know. Okay. Oh, this guy, here we go. This guy was left in an apartment. That's how we came upon him. So he was left in somebody's apartment. Unfortunately, it's not just cats and dogs. It's a big guy. Actually, Casey and I live in the same development, and we just had a rabbit outside. That was our second one within the year, a pet rabbit. This one, the first one, it took four people to chase it around and capture it. This one, Casey just here, and it came right over. So it is still up there. It's still up there in quarantine. We have to quarantine it for at least 10 to 14 days. And then it will be offered for sale no, letting people know it did not come from a breeder. It was simply found outside. So Casey saved that one's life. Because in our apartment complex, not going to survive. Not going to survive out there. Not a, not a domestic rabbit. All right, cool. You did a good job. It's like, okay, yeah, I'll eat this. <laughs> okay. 
All right, Marie, or, well, we, next one we're going to take a look at is our leopard gecko. Uh, do we have a crested? Okay. So our, yep. yep. So our leopard gecko is a land gecko. They have little tiny toenails that keep them on the ground. The other one will be our crested gecko. Those have suction cup feet. They can go right up that blue pole, go across the ceiling, and hang upside down. Leopard geckos make a pretty good choice for a pet because they are on the ground. At least if they get out at home, you're going to be looking for them on the floor, not up in the ceiling. Hold on. Okay, so Marie has our leopard gecko. Now, our leopard gre thank you. Our leopard gecko can close his eyes and he can stick out his tongue and use his tongue to clean those eyeballs. So if he would be in a dusty area for whatever reason, he could use his tongues to clean his eyeballs like a little windshield wiper. He also has a true little voice box. Sometimes when we go in their enclosure, we'll often use something like this, which is cork bark for their um, hide. And the reason we use cork bark a lot is when you come up to the table, you pick this up, it's like featherweight. So at least if they get under there, it's not something that's going to crush them. So we're very aware that cork bark is wonderful, especially for smaller, more delicate animals like the leopard gecko. But oftentimes we'll pick up the cork bark and they'll be under there to look up and go shh. And they sound like little dolphins. And I don't think we can get them to make any noise, but they do sound like little dolphins. Their skin is very soft and sensitive like velvet. If you were to pull on his skin too tightly, it would rip like this piece of paper. Now, what would a reptile do to heal that? Shed their skin. When he sheds his skin, he will first look like somebody dumped baby powder all over him. He will turn around, he will pull his shedding off, and he will eat it. Very good for him, nutritional-wise. Also, a great way for him to cover up his tracks so the predators do not know that he's around. So they eat their shedding. His tail, he stores fat in his tail. Doesn't mean he turns around and eats his tail if he gets hungry, but he stores fat. His tail should be plump like it is there. If he can't get to food for a while, like worms or nectar from flowers or gecko food that we mix with water, this is for crusties, but we have a, a leopard gecko food as well. If he can't get to that for a while, his body will draw up the fat that's in that tail. The tail will get skinny, but he'll go for a while without any food at all. If he's being chased by a predator, he'll run as far as the little legs carry him. After a bit, he's too tired, he drops his tail right off. Doesn't need to be pulled on or caught on anything, he drops it right off, and that little tail wiggles around all by itself, unattached from his body, for up to 10 minutes. The predator eats the wiggling tail, leaves the gecko alone, gecko runs away and hides, and eventually grows a whole new tail. Now, a lot of our lizards cannot regrow their body parts, but the gecko can regrow his tail. All right, now this guy, oh my gosh. Yeah, I think we're, I think we're going to have uh, Marie bring him around. He is in here, trust me. <laughs> Actually, we can leave him on a table, and that way they can look at him afterwards. There's a tiny, tiny, tiny little crested gecko. This is an egg that um, these guys would have came out of. Do you see how tiny that is? And um, the crested gecko has those suction cup feet. If he got out of here, he could go and climb on top of the aviary, he could climb up the blue pole, he could hang upside down, he can do anything he wants because of the suction cup feet. So these geckos are not a land gecko, they're more of a tree dweller. They like to be up in a tree. And even in this little tiny travel container, you can see that he chose to be right up there in the top. If he drops his tail off, he does not tend to grow that tail back because when you're up in a tree, the tail's sort of cumbersome, you don't really need it. So crested geckos, they also can drop their tail, but they don't grow a new one like the leopard gecko does. <laughs> and they are just adorable. <laughs> but you'll be able to see him a little closer later. <laughs> so cute. Okay, Casey, what else do we... Uh... Oh, no, no, we're ready. We're ready for Crazy Frog Lady. It's your turn, okay. We'll let Sarah take over and talk to you about her amphibians. Yeah, yeah this is good. You're good. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so we're Crazy Frog Ladies. I have several frogs at home. Um, these are cactus frogs. 
so yeah. that's a good one. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 So, um, at the end of the show, yeah, you guys are welcome to come up. I just ask that you put gloves on to touch them because they have very sensitive skin. Um, the oils on our hands can actually affect them and can heal them. These guys, when they eat dubia roaches or anything like that, you have to calcify them with um, D3. Uh, I do calcium with D3 once a week, and I do regular calcium the other two times that I feed. Um, the calcium has to be absorbed through sunlight. So again, like reptiles, these guys need to have a breakfast time ball plus their nightlight plus a day ball. So on each tank, I have three lights for each one. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, okay. they're easy to handle, easy to yep. care of, and they live in eco Right. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Casey, which we have two groups left. We have mammals, and do we have any of our arachnids? Oh, well, we can, we'll get those out afterwards and check. Do we have any tarantulas, or do we have a centipede? Tarantula, okay, let's look at a tarantula. Now tarantulas will shed their skin much like the reptiles do, but when they shed, it's an exoskeleton, they leave behind a perfect little mold of themselves. So if you take a look at our sheddings, you'll be able to see the fangs. If they've lost a part of a limb, they will start to regenerate that during their shed. Typically they'll lay inside, upside down inside their enclosure and they will lay there very still, sometimes hours, sometimes a day, sometimes more. Then they will crawl out. There's a little, uh, let's see if we can see it here. There is a little, yes, you can see it on this one, a little flap over their abdomen that'll open up and they're very soft and squishy when they're molting. So they basically roll up real tight like, pop out of there and you know a pop-up tent? You guys ever put up a pop-up tent to go camping and you sort of set it down and it goes poof, that's how a tarantula goes when it comes out of its shed. Leaves behind a perfect little mold of themselves. They will eat insects, they'll also eat pinky mice. Uh, they use their venom in their fangs to inject a little bit of venom in that prey, and then they suck out and leave it to dry. So basically when you're looking after they've eaten, you see a little shell of whatever it was that they ate. And this is our little pink tail. They are arboreal, a tree dwelling tarantula. Most of the others are ground dwellers, and they definitely have little pink toes. We don't typically handle our tarantulas. If you would be allergic to a bee sting, you could be allergic to a tarantula bite. Yeah, I'm allergic to bee stings. I would have more chance of being allergic to a tarantula bite, so I definitely don't handle them. But there are people that handle their tarantulas and have no problems with them. Um, they also have a hair on their body that can tend to be very irritating. If they get scared or they're just angry or upset, they will flick their hair off at you and it has a little barb on the end, like a hook on the end of a fish hook, and that can get into your skin. So they're really just a look at pet, uh, just like our fish are. You don't really take your fish out and pet them. It's the same with most of our tarantulas. Again, there are people that do handle them, but I choose not to because I am allergic to, to bee sticks. Okay. All right, Casey, we have May the ferret. We'll take May is another one of our store pets. And May is a deaf ferret and she is a troublemaker. We have had the alarm go off in the store and when people are at home, they're looking to see what's going on. They see the cameras and there's May sniffing right into the camera like, oh, how, who are you and what are you doing? If you go into our small animal room, you'll notice that the ferret playpen has huge binder clips about every inch. That's because of May. If you take one of those binder clips out, she will find that spot and she will squeeze out. She is an escape artist. Um, she's very friendly. She does have a buddy that she lives with up there because ferrets do well in groups. We also do try to get baby ferrets in for people to buy. Uh, they're a very slim supply, like a lot of other products, a lot of other animals. There are not that many out there right now because of the uh, things related to the pandemic. Uh, but ferrets live an average of five years. Some of them make it to seven. They're fun in groups. And the nice thing about a ferret is even if you buy one today and you decide, I'd like to add another ferret six months from now, in most cases, you put those ferrets together and they'll have a little pecking order. But after a few days, you'll see that they'll sleep in a big bunch and they'll be very good buddies. 
They love to play. They're like a kitten that never grows up. When um, ferrets were used more so than domesticated for, um, for pets, they had jobs. And one of the jobs would be to go out with a hunter and flush out rabbit and other kind of varmints that would be in holes. They would send a ferret down to flush out the uh, whatever the farmer was trying to shoot or the hunter was trying to shoot. Also, they would put a harness on them and they would wire underground. So they put a harness on, attach a wire, send the ferret down, and the ferret would move through the tunnel and come out the other side. You'd have your wiring done. So they actually had jobs to do. Um, now they're more for pets, um, but they, they are a very good pet. They do have an odor. It's either, oh my gosh, what is that smell? Or smell, I don't, I don't smell it. It's like cilantro. Have you ever heard about that? There's people that love cilantro and there's people who like, think it tastes like soap. It's the same way with the parrot. You either don't mind it at all and hardly notice it, or you're like, oh my gosh. And if you're one of those, oh my gosh, you're not gonna ferret. Because even though they're descented when they come to us, they have a musky odor. And it, it retain, they retain that their whole life, that musky odor. One of the things that people often don't do that they should do to keep that odor down is you need to wash their bedding. They love to sleep suspended in hammocks. You need to wash the hammock. You need to wash their toys, anything they're up against because that oil gets on those. And you're washing your ferret, and the more you wash your ferret, the more oil it produces to replenish. And then you're like, this still smells. And in most cases, it's because you didn't wash the things that were in the cage. Okay, and our last pet that we're gonna talk about is um, one of one of our kittens from the Centerville Pet Rescue, and his name is Rowan. And Rowan was found in East Earl as a stray and had some eye problems when he came in. Now, Centerville Pet Rescue does work with, uh, our, our main vet is actually Dr. Mick. She has a practice down in, in Strasburg. She's one of our um, part-time vets that we have. We also deal with Helping Hands, which is a clinic in New Danville that helps people who have feral cats. They can trap them, bring them in, get them medical, and get them spayed and neutered, which is very important. And then they go back out. It's trap, neuter, and release. So they do that program. Um, in the, in the uh, Centerville Pet Rescue, all of the animals, all the cats, before they go home, they are spayed or neutered. They have all their shots that they need. And they also are microchipped, because if they get out, they want to be able to get them back. So they're all, um, all of that is done. Rowan is a love bug and he also loves to play. So I heard he's very playful. If you're looking for a new addition for your, for your family and you want a playful little kitten, Rowan is your guy, right Wendy? <laughs> they are, they take applications. You can email them in, you get pre-approved and then they will set up an appointment during the week if you want to come in, or on Saturdays only from 12 to 4, you can just walk in. There's no appointment needed, but they do limit it to how many people can be in the room at once. And really that's a great idea because, you know, if, if the room is very crowded, you're not going to really get a good idea on how the cat's personality is because the cat's going to be, could be a little scared because of all the different people that you see. It's, you're a cutie. Yeah, you're a cutie. We do not um, allow our cats to be declawed. Um, we feel that declawing is like taking part of your finger off. Uh, that's something that we have in our contract. And a lot of, actually, there's two states now, right, Wendy? There's two states now that have outlawed that, and we're hoping that Pennsylvania gets on board. Uh, cats need their claws. They really do. Uh, now, sometimes we get a cat in that has already been declawed. Of course, we can't really do anything about that, but as a rule, we. We do not allow our cats to be declawed. Okay. All right. So if you want to take a look at Rowan afterwards, he's in the adoption room again. You have to wait for your turn to get in there, right, Rowan? But he's waiting. Yeah, he's waiting. <laughs> okay. And Casey tells me we have some other animals that we didn't talk about. Oh, we have hermit crabs. Hermit crabs are very popular this time of year because. Thank you, Wendy. So a lot of people go to the beach and they see the cool hermit crabs and then they either buy one or they don't buy one. They say, I'll buy one when we get back home. Uh, this is their travel container. Of course, all these animals are in travel containers. These are not what they live in. You've probably seen our hermit crab enclosure. It has soil in the bottom. It has a mister. It has a heat light. Hermit crabs also are not hermits. They don't do well by themselves. They do well in groups. 
They have lungs, like book lungs, that need to be kept moist at all times. One of the big causes of death in a hermit crab is that people don't understand that although they don't swim anymore, they came from the ocean. Um, that is where they come and then they come out as they get older and uh, they're bred there. So basically they're coming out almost like a frog coming out as a tadpole. So when you get a hermit crab, you need to keep them moist. You, lack of humidity suffocates them. So it's very important that hermit crabs are kept moist. They need to have shells and not just like one bigger shell. They can be very particular about what shell they're going to pick out and you need to give them a lot of choices. Otherwise, they'll stay in a shell that's way too small and their body parts stick out, which makes them very vulnerable to things like infection and scratching from anything that's in their enclosure. So you want to have a lot of different shells in there. And we can answer any questions that you have if you're thinking about getting a hermit crab. Uh, we have uh, hermit crab care sheets. We also have care sheets on the other animals that we, that we showed here today. Okay. Euromastic, yes. Looks like some, oh, in shed, okay. So lizards, a lot of times they shed different parts of their body at different times. They don't shed it off in one big piece. This guy looks like he got run over by a tractor. That tail is part of his protection. He would burrow into tight fitting rocks, leave the tail stick out, whip it back and forth. And although it doesn't look like he would do that, if he was scared, if he was not used to being handled, he would whip that tail and it would, Pin prick you. You'd look down and have little drops of, of your blood, basically, uh, because that tail is so sharp. So that is their protection. They need to be about 110 to 120 degrees during the day, dropping down to about 60 degrees at night. So all these reptiles have different what we call comfort zones. That's why when you get a reptile as a pet or an amphibian as a pet, you want to find out what is their comfort zone and you need to provide it. You don't just go and buy a bulb and plug it in and hope for the best. It's not like that. Also why we recommend larger enclosures. So you're providing a temperature gradient. You got a hot end and then your end over here is your cooler end and your reptile should go back and forth between your heated end and your cooler end. That's thermal regulate. Okay, are we ready guys for them to come up and take a closer look at us? Okay, now please, if you come up and you touch anything, including the table, because we've been messy and we've got dirt on the table even, please make sure you use hand sanitizer. If you don't like hand sanitizer, we have public restroom up front. You can use soap and water if you prefer. Any animal can carry germs, so it's very important to make sure you wash your hands. And we have coloring books. Help yourself to a coloring book when you come up, please. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you very much. We do this about once a month. So if you want to come back or tell your friends, check our Facebook page. Thank you.